<laughs> Gigantic pain. It looks like we got things going. It looks like everything's going well. Third time's the charm. Luckily enough, by this third time going through this, I think I should have this lecture down pat by now. But welcome, Chapter 3, When I Say No, I Feel Guilty, Dr. Manuel Smith. And let's just get to it. Um, kudos, I notice a lot of people have been very patient with this one. I'm not sure what the problem is. I've gone through a whole bunch of troubleshooting on my end. Basically uninstalled and reinstalled and uh, fiddled with the sorts of everything, done about everything we can, and looks like we should be good to go. Stream is staying in excellent condition. And, as it looks now, things are going well. I'm going to switch that one to a fade, make it look rather nice. Anyways, guys, welcome in. Hopefully the music levels are good. I see there's seven people here already, which is awesome. We had two interview guys this morning. Again, hopefully we got this one going through this time. Do let me know in the chat if you see the quality or things drop off on this one. So, hey, guys. How's things? If this drops off, let me know in chat. All right, so let's get to it then. Let's go all the way back to square one. Where did I leave off? Everyday assertive rights, the common ways people manipulate us. I like this chapter. It's a super dense chapter. It's full of a bunch of assertive bills of rights that we've talked about before. And it's funny when you look at this through a red-pilled lens, how many examples you can go through, which is good because the examples he uses here are so dated and out of touch that you really have to kind of apply them with a nice modern, younger audience. So we're starting with the assertive right number two. You have the right to offer no reasons or excuses to justify your behavior. Again, if you are your own ultimate judge, you do not need to explain your behavior for somebody else for them to decide if it's right, wrong, correct, incorrect, or whatever tag they want to use. Of course, other people may have the assertive option to tell you they don't like what you're doing. Well, then you can disregard their preferences or work on a compromise or respect it or change your behavior completely. The childish belief that underlies this type of manipulation goes something like this. You should explain your reasons for your behavior to other people since you are responsible to them for your actions. You should justify your actions to them. This here is what we're getting at. It's a nice acronym. It's called DEAR or Defend, Excuse, Explain, and Rationalize. Ah, okay. So it's a YouTube issue then. Well, that's good to know that they screwed this up, but that's fine. Third hour into this, we're going to have it nice down pat. Um, de defend, excuse, explain, and rationalize. Guys do this constantly, and they always defer to their wives. And this is a very bad sexual strategy, and I'll explain why. In communication, and I've talked about it before, you have open communication and closed communication. Open communication being the sharing of ideas, surface level, the words, and the meanings behind them. Closed communication is usually filled with other things like validation seeking and subtext and power games. And you can put it onto a graph. Take a human interaction. I have an article that talk about it more, by the way, on my uh, blog. It's called Power Games, a field guide. But take an interaction, put it on a grid. On the one side of the grid, you put harmony. Uh, are we on the same team or are we adversarial? And on the other side of the grid, we put our status. Is this person higher status than me or lower status? So when you deer or you explain yourself to somebody, what you're doing is you're putting yourself on the lower side of the status there. I'm lower status than you and we're on the same team, which codes for submissiveness. Now, if that sounds like a female quality, it generally is because when a girl sees a guy as her hypergamous best option, they tend to act more submissive. It's, uh, it's a trait of, in the same way that I say healthy, board, healthy narcissism for men is a good thing, healthy levels of borderline is good for a girl. And in this case, deferring to a prize, as she puts it, is the good thing. And so by you doing this, you're actually displaying female characteristics, which become very unattractive. At the same time, doesn't really work too well. And it's extremely common, especially, I always joke around that it's the Redditor thing. It's like, everybody else is so stupid. If they only knew the information I would knew, they would make the exact choice that I made. And this is that exact same non-assertive behavior. And this is the reason why everybody hates Redditors. And I don't blame them. I've been one for 12 years. In the last two years, I'm just like, dudes, you're killing me. What the hell have you done? Why is everybody a communist? You know what I mean? But like examples of this, it's sometimes it's just the tone of voice when they ask you, what are you doing? 
Sometimes it's that Karen type of chick that tries to treat everybody around her like she's one of their kids, like they're one of her kids. Like this stuff manifests in so many different ways, but the rule of thumb and something to keep in mind is when you feel the need to explain yourself because somebody questions you or defend yourself or excuse it, don't. This is why shutting the F up is one of like the key strategies, especially for a guy starting off. Not only with just like unattractive behaviors, shedding those, but in this case, non-assertive behaviors, your need to open your mouth and defend yourself is always working against you. And so shutting the F up is a great way of culling that one as well. Da, da, da. All right. So the next one is assertive right number three. You have the right to judge whether you are responsible for finding solutions to other people's problems. Again, is my mouse dead? Look at that. One more thing died off. That's fine. We'll use the touchpad. <laughs> I'm happy by shirt. Oh yeah, I guess you guys haven't seen the shirt all day. It's been a nice summer day and it just started raining right as I did this live stream. Um, getting back to the point. Okay, so are you responsible for other people's happiness? And the answer to that is no. One more please actually has a great quote on this where he says, happiness is a choice. And it's very true and it's surprisingly easy to understand, but very hard to map. Like a lot of guys will, when their girl is in a bad mood or giving him the silent treatment, they feel the need to like coddle her or find out what's wrong or try to fix her mood by dancing like a dancing monkey. Same thing with the girl they find they're hitting on at the bar. They find her uh, attractive, but she's not feeling it. So they think they need to dance in front of her, doing parlor tricks, magic tricks. They call it dancing monkey game and it's never been very good. So each of us is ultimately responsible for our own psychological well-being, happiness, and success. As much as we might wish good things for one another, we really do not have the ability to create mental stability, well-being, or happiness for somebody else. Now, if your first thought to this after hearing that line is about Captain save -a well, then that's exactly what he's talking about. She doesn't want to be saved, bro. Like, she just doesn't. You see examples, tons of it. And anybody here who's had a bit of a rougher upbringing will tell you, They've all, we've all seen situations. I remember this at the bar. I would go to this redneck bar, but my college all the time down. And uh, a girl and a guy would be getting into a fight and then some white knight would walk on, try and like get up in front of the guy, getting mad at him, telling her, him, leave the girl alone. The guy beats him up and the girl ends up helping him beat him up. It's basically these situations where a lot of the times like, girls are just hooked on the feelings and they like being negative and they like being positive because it's strong and it's honestly why i've developed a, a, the strategy i call the manufactured outrage because for some reason women when it comes to emotions it's like a fuel tank for them they have to they have to refill it every now and again and this is why you always get they always get in fights with their mothers or they always get in fights with co-workers they're very aggressive with this there's always somebody who's messing with them and some hardship in their life they have to deal with as a guy, this is very frustrating because you end up being reactive. They get mad one day. It has nothing to do with you. You didn't know it was coming. The kids get this. If mommy had a bad day at work, then they're taking it out on the kids, yelling at them. How do you deal with this stuff? And this is kind of one strategy to do it where proactively you end up building up those emotions the same way you're like filling up, topping up the tank, starting a fight over something stupid, something you don't care about. You're building it up. You're getting really serious and everybody's getting mad and emotions are going and then you just drop it and you don't care. It sounds goofy, but it's a nice proactive way of dealing with it. Now, I said earlier that their emotions aren't your problem, and it's right. Here's the thing, though. This isn't you taking responsibility for it because there's no guarantee that you can fix somebody's emotions. All you're doing is you're giving just enough drama in your life that you don't have to deal with it by surprise. How the other person reacts is irrelevant. This is strictly for your well-being. Now you can always, a lot of guys always argue, well, my girl never does this and my girl never does that. And my girl is bland pablum, thank you very much. And I'm like, you must be blessed, sir. You must be blessed. I wish all of us could find girls like your STEM graduate girl who's even keel and level. And I'm sure the sex life is just great. So for the rest of us, just realize emotions are a thing. Don't take responsibility for them, but at the same time, be aware of how to lead them. It works out better for you in the end anyway. Um, the childish belief underlating this type of manipulation goes something like this. You have an obligation to things and institutions greater than yourself, which groups of others have set up to conduct the business of living. You should sacrifice your own values to keep these systems from falling apart. If they do not always work, they should be bend or, you should bend or change, not the system. 
if any problems occur in dealing with the system, they're your problems and not the responsibility of the system. Again, two big examples for this, I would argue Catholic guilt. Huge example of it. You are a sinner, there's something wrong with you, you should feel guilty and you come to me for absolution. And this is why a whole bunch of devoutly religious people are the ones that have some of the most serious relationship issues. If you haven't noticed right now, women have kind of invaded the church because women are the ones still showing up and so the clergy kind of panders to them. So the same ways that guys used to have this confessional and have their priest and have that guilt there, it's now being applied to the women in their life and it's a very horrible, tragic situation. But just understanding that them being disappointed in you is not your obligation to feel bad about it. They're allowed to feel whatever they want. You're allowed not to care, but that's a different issue. I love this. And this is probably the most Christianish shit like thing I'm going to get at right now, but it's the serenity prayer. God give me the strength to change the things I can, the courage to accept the things I can't, and the wisdom to know the difference. And that's part of it too. Some things you just can't change and you just, it's not my job to fix the world. And I'd argue this is where Jordan Peterson gets things wrong, where he says that the reason guys are struggling right now is because they don't have enough responsibility. And I think that's the absolute worst thing he could have said. Because responsibility only works with authority. And if there's no authority, this extra responsibility, again, is just taking the responsibility for other people's feelings and problems and basically propping up the system. And I think it's a horrible thing. Like what you're seeing right now is basically boomers and Gen Xers berating 23 year old men for the world being going into hell in a handbasket. It's their job to fix it. It's like, dude, they didn't create this world. You did. And you're not even asking them to fix it for themselves. You're asking them to fix it for your children so that way your children don't have to live through it. It's like, no, no, man. Ain't, it ain't working, cuz. But uh, next one is a sort of right four. You have the right to change your mind. Now, I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth between these two because there's a point about marriage I want to address that kind of touches on both of them. So if you change your mind, other people may resist the new choice by manipulation based on any of the childish beliefs we have seen. The most common one goes something like this. You should not change your mind after you've committed yourself. If you change it, something is wrong. You should justify your new choice or admit that you were in error. If you were in error, you have shown that you are irresponsible, likely to be wrong again, cause problems. Therefore, you are not capable of making decisions by yourself. Right there is perfection and why it sucks in a nutshell. Now, this is another person manipulating you, but a lot of times we do this to ourselves. Think of the guy, and I don't know if any of you guys have had this problem. I used to have this problem. The need to be perfect. And I was really good, so it was very easy for me to like go along with perfection. I think I even talk about it in one of my book in the book there, chapter three, chapter two, maybe. But if you think that being perfect is what the other person expects from you, it's that nice guy paradigm. If I do what I think other people want me to do, they will love me forever and I'll have a problem free life. In this case, perfection is that surrogate in there. But here's the problem: humans are fallible. Sometimes things fail even when you do all the right decisions. But just because you make a mistake, just because you change your mind, just because you've decided that something is better or worse does not mean that you get to be judged for it. Now, I know it sounds like a chick thing. It's like a girl gets to change her mind whenever she wants. And yeah, that is a female strategy for sure. But here's the thing. You're going to find a lot of red pill strategies are just female strategies adopted to male sensibilities. <laughs> hey, Marty. Female strategies down to male sensibilities. Dread, perfect example of that. What is Dread game? But it's essentially a female branch swing. Six months before the marriage is over, she checks out of it, starts working out, getting hot, getting fit, flirting with a bunch of dudes. She ends the marriage when she has another guy lined up. Dread is essentially that, but with an olive branch. On the understanding that the girl gets her act together and starts fighting to keep you around, well, then that's still on the table. And that's... That's the nice thing about a lot of this stuff. It's whatever works. So jumping back then, um, we're talking about mind changing in that, as well as before about taking the responsibility for other people. Dalrock, great article called Threat Point. I'm gonna put it in the chat right now so you guys can see it. I think I did this the first time too. So bear with me here. We're gonna take a little bit of a meander. So in the literature on the economics of the family, there has been growing consensus on the need to take bargaining and distribution within marriage seriously. Such models of the family rely on a threat point to determine distribution within the household. The switch to a unilateral divorce regime redistributes power in a marriage, giving power to the person who wants out 
and reducing it held by the partner interested in preserving it. So what they're talking about is how it used to be at fault divorce. Both people had to agree. There had to be something there to cause the divorce. Now for a bunch of reasons, it switched to no fault divorce. And this is where I'm just going to sum up the thing here. You guys kind of already, you should already know this speech by now. So to see how divorce laws affect the external threat point, note that prior to unilateral divorce, a partner wishing to dissolve the marriage could leave without their spouse's content. However, in such a situation, a legal force divorce is not guaranteed. And as such, the right to remarry is forfeited. Under unilateral divorce, the value of an exit threat increases for the unsatisfied spouse as the right to remarry is retained regardless of positions. Thus, the exit threat model predicts that changes in divorce regimes will have real effects. If the divorce threat is sufficiently credible, it may directly affect intrafamilial bargaining outcomes without the option ever being exercised. And this is what we're talking about. A lot of this stuff now with assertiveness is that guys are so worried about divorce rape that they are actually given a cooling off where they don't act assertive because they're worried that as long as they, you know, supplicate, play dead, then maybe they won't try and divorce and take all their kids and half their money. But that's the thing. Counterintuitively, by being more assertive, by not letting these things weaponize you, you actually become less likely to have them used against you. David Dutton, Wisdom of Psychopaths, great book. He actually had a section in there where he interviewed a bunch of psychopaths just by showing them videos of people, asking them which one they would mug. And they were all, they all picked the same guys. So people actually know who soft targets are. Intuitively, we just kind of know. So if you look like a simp, you're going to get simped. Uh, to attach on to this one, which is going to lead to the next point. So it's very easy to talk about this stuff. Let's talk about like weaponized sex and weaponized relationships. That's usually what happens. The girl will say, you know, no sex unless you do more dishes. Or if you did more dishes, maybe it'd be comfortable. So I would want to sleep with you more. That's one way of like weaponizing it. Second one is like, well, if you don't do this, we're getting a divorce. I'm done. Those are very easy to convince the guy that they're in his best interest not to negotiate with terrorists. For the sex one, if it's a girl, demote her to plate, soft next her, go find yourself somebody else. That's abundance. That works perfectly. For a marriage, obviously those same rules are there because infidelity is no longer illegal. So really the only thing keeping you there is the understanding that the other person is giving it their all. But here's one that's a little harder to understand, but also more important to visualize for yourself why it's important. Everybody here who's over the age of 35, possibly some kids will know a story of a guy who stuck with a girl. Maybe she had a surprise baby and he stuck it around for the kids to be noble. Maybe she churned after they got married, whatever. But you know it, there's this guy who's absolutely miserable, cannot stand and hates his wife, but he loves his kids. His wife treats him like crap and he sticks around for them and he's absolutely miserable. So. From this threat point perspective, I want you to consider the op the, uh, the options here. You can either be 100% dad 50% of the time or a 0% dad 100% of the time. Which one do you think raises better kids? And this is a lot harder for guys to understand. I did I have a relationship breakdown where I talk about true dadness, the only guy from Married Red Pill ever to lose his flair, by the way, where he had a one-itis to his children like that to the point that he actively sabotaged the relationships from this lack of assertiveness. He would always use, uh, he would try bribery, he would try gifts, he would try manipulation, and the wife would try that too, holding the kids back until he does this and he does that. Again, these things only have power if you give it to them. And the one way you can tell when somebody's truly hardcore understood the concept of like, his own rational egoism or his own self-interest is when he's no longer able to have his kids weaponized against him like this. And it's a hard pill for guys to swallow. Very hard. And I'm not, I'm not surprised and I'm very empathic to the kind of guy who can't make that choice. So leaving it there though, that's something for you guys to mull over as you read through this. Anyways, we're going to slip onto the assertive right number five. You have the right to make mistakes and be responsible for them. Our assertive right to make errors and be responsible simply describes part of the reality of being human. I love this line. I love this line because it goes to show there's like a problem. Everybody always kind of feels there's like a problem with, uh, we'll use example, the conservative argument of big daddy government taking care of everything, or uh, the guy doesn't want to be coddled or pampered by his girl. Like there's something there, never articulate, but you kind of feel it. But the idea that you're not in control of your own life 
and that you're no longer responsible for the consequences of your actions, it's a very off-putting thing. It's also a very unassertive thing or a non-assertive thing. But the childish belief underlying this manipulation is approximately as followed. You must not make errors. Errors are wrong and cause problems to other people. If you make errors, you should feel guilty. You are likely to make errors and problems and therefore you cannot cope properly or make proper decisions. Other people should control your behavior and decisions so you will not cause problems. In this way, you can make up for the wrong you have done to them. Right there, you can kind of see the problems with it. It's a very childish belief, the idea that you need to be taken care of because you can't be trusted with your own agency. Now, this is kind of beyond just flirting with girls. This is beyond getting attracted with wife. This is about self-actualization and self-determination. This stuff, put a pin in this, because this is going to come in handy later on when we start talking about hypothetical and categorical imperatives. But the example he uses here is actually a gender swift one. It's about a wife who's being non-assertive and should be. The idea is she screwed up, cost the husband a whole bunch of extra work. And so when they talk about when the wife is non-assertive enough to let her husband make judgments about her behavior for her, she is likely to deny the behavior, give reasons why she should not or she could not make the entry, uh, hand wave the importance of the error, forcing her husband to either suppress his feelings about her error, thereby resenting her, or to escalate the conflict into a fight to express his non-assertive, angry feelings, or apologize for making an error that inconvenienced him and feel resentfully obligated to make it up to him. On the other hand, if his wife is assertive enough to make her own judgment about her errors, she would likely reply to the raising of the issue by saying, you're right, that was dumb, eh, mistakes happened. And this ties into apologies. Very, as far as we get to like a hard and fast red pill rule is the one of never apologizing and never apologize. Again, back to what I was talking about before with the, uh, the power and the harmony in closed conversation. An apology is automatically putting the somebody as higher status than you. And it also puts them in an unknown position. They can either forgive you and be on the same team or not forgive you or put more hurdles on you and be against you. So either way, it does not work out in your best interest from power games perspective. At the same time, act, actions matter more than words. We had a lot of field reports where guys were constantly feeling the need to apologize to their wife. Or she was constantly demanding it. They would build up this justification as to why it was warranted. And we would just ask one question. Well, a few questions, but the big one was, okay, did you actually screw up? Is she right? And a lot of times the guy's like, okay, maybe I, well, from her perspective, but I don't think so. I was like, all right, so it's not then. So then why the hell are you apologizing? Or maybe it's a case where he's like, yeah, I screwed up big. I'm like, all right, we'll fix it. So then what about the apology? Like, well, fixing it was the apology. You know, I want you an apology. Look, I already fixed it, all right? I already told you I screwed up. That's it. It's uh, done with. By not supplicating, you're keeping your status high. You're keeping that hypergamous instinct intact. And you're generally over the long term, making yourself have a healthier, more attractive relationship over the long haul. Again, it's never just big events. It's like hundreds and hundreds of these little things over the course of a decade or two decades or three decades that all matter. So when I talk about each of these ones, it's hard to say like none of them are going to be the keystone to a happy and healthy relationship. But a thousand of these together will equal the difference between, you know, Chad, Chad relationship and, you know, virgin relationship. Get what I'm saying? Should find a link for it. It was a great post actually by Royce Chateau Artiste who talked about apologies. It's like if something doesn't die, then don't even worry about it. Or you get two in your lifetime. Use them sparingly. Um, Chad Worthington. I know Rolo has an article on him called Alpha Buddha. And Royce's is uh, I'm sorry. Actually, you know what? I'll pull that one up. There she is. So for further reading, if you guys want to see this, I'm going to put it in the live stream now. We got Rational Mail with uh, his post on Alpha. And I'm hoping... There she is. And Chateau Ortiz on I'm sorry. This puts a really good damper on this idea.
Yeah, hey Pepsi, I see you on here. Yeah, it turns out YouTube was having some problems with their streaming service, so we've had to do a couple couple cold starts, but we're back on the go right now. We're good to go. <sighs> Where'd I leave off? All right, so far so good. So here's the thing, like, your ability to handle your own mistakes and take ownership of them is a really human part of your life. It's what separates you from being a child. And there's nothing attractive about being a child. There's no dignity in it. So I would argue, I mean, there's two Jane main principles of guys who talk about the red pill. It's sexual strategy for men and a positive male identity. And I would argue this one does both. It both keeps your status high within a relationship as well as salvages that little bit of dignity that men have nowadays and allows you to thrive in ways that other men can't. Segwaying into assertive right number six, you have the right to say, I don't know. And it's based on the childhood belief that you should have answers to any question about the possible consequences of your actions. Because if you don't have them, you're unaware of the problems you will cause and therefore are irresponsible and must be controlled. Again, it's a very manipulative technique. Um, we talk about unintended consequences a lot, and there's some merit to it. Now, from a political standpoint, obviously, you should be wary of making large changes because you're not aware of the unintended consequences. But we're going under the assumption that the person reading this knows what they're doing and they're not otherwise incompetent. We're not fortune tellers. We're all fallible humans. We will make mistakes. We're already going to be willing to own up to them in the ways that matter to us, not in the ways of apologizing and asking for placation by other people. At the same time, we also have to trust in our ability, and this is where self-improvement comes in. We have to trust in our ability to solve the problems as they come up. Like, don't you, aren't you worried about this? Aren't you worried about that? Yeah, I am, but you know what? I can handle it, I'm a smart guy. I always said, it was like a joke, I used to my life way before all this stuff where, um, you know what, I, it sounded like I knew what I was doing when I made the decision, so I'm sure I can help that guy finish, follow through. Got me through a lot of things. You'd be surprised how many issues are non-issues and very solvable. And a lot of the time, those consequences, those unintended consequences are things you can live with anyway. So they're not a reason not to do something. In fact, one of the easiest ways you can tell if somebody is just risk averse is if they start trying to find any convoluted reason to not do something. Basically, instead of the assertive right number six, they're actively going against it and using it not to act on something. And it lets you know right there that you're dealing with non-assertive behavior. Uh, next one up is number seven. So you have the right to be independent of the goodwill of others before coping with them. No matter what you or I do, someone is not going to like it. Someone may even get his feelings hurt as a result. If you assume that in order to adequately cope with somebody, you must first need his goodwill and as a brother or a friend, you leave yourself open to as much manipulative leverage as you need for goodwill, dictates. Contrary to this common assumption, you do not need the goodwill of other people to deal with them effectively and assertively. This is so true if for no other reason than you don't need a girl to like you to sleep with you. Got tons of examples of this. You can, if you really wanted to get in the weeds, there's Dr. David Buss and Cindy Vincent's Why Women Have Sex, and they show the motivations for there. Almost none of it is based on being friends with a guy. Being friend zone does not in a way in a girl's pants. Sexual attraction and uh, friendship and comfort are two separate topics. It's as Rolla would put it, the alpha fucks and the beta bucks. The need for people to be off friendly terms before you can start making your wants known is a very non-assertive behavior and it makes it very easy to manipulate you because whether girls and like, I've asked girls and I can't tell if they're lying or they really don't know, but they know the friend zone is a manipulative thing. I, there's some part of them that knows whether they know and they won't say, or they just don't know, but they kind of know, they know. The idea that somebody wants to sleep with you and you're using, they want you to like them first. They can use that validation to get just about as much validation from you as they possibly want without having to give you anything. It's basically the business model of a Twitch streamer. Yeah, you'll never be loved if you can't risk being disliked. It's a good example for this. Now, here's the thing. It's not just relationships either from a brand perspective or a dating perspective. Okay, Cupid had a great article on why you should be going after that weird girl. And they brought up two types of women that they found on there. There was some that every guy would say was like a six or a seven out of 10. Very cute girl, not hot, but cute. They would actually get less messages than these very polarizing girls, you know, tattoos, goofy hair, all those standard things. They would find that 
it was a much more divisive polarizing thing they would find that uh five guys would call them a nine and five guys would call them a two but they ended up getting more messaging and higher engagement and this is by not waiting and not trying to be liked by as many people as possible and the same goes for if you're in a business of branding being polarizing to a certain extent is a great way of helping niche your market segment to the point where you can actually have a good relationship with your customers or clients or fans or whatever the point is our childish belief which uses people as the basis for this type of manipulation expresses itself like this you must have the goodwill of people you relate to or they can prevent you from doing anything you need the cooperation of other people in order to survive it's very important that they like you and examples of manipulation based on this belief are everyday occurrences, particularly in close relationships, but also the authority of relationships of work and school. Jumping back, for those who are here for the No More Mr. Nice Guy stuff, again, go back and check it out after this if you haven't. Talks a lot about errant parenting strategies. Key point being a lot of moms, what they do when they're raising kids, instead of being consistent with punishment and being assertive in the way that I want you to clean your room because I'm your mom and that's what I want. It's always good boys do this or good boys do that. And then she goes to the husband, well, a real man would do this and a real man would do that. She's basically attacking these guys' insecurity through identity. And it's these types of things here that make insecure people very and non-assertive people extremely easily manipulate. I would argue a huge portion of guys, so long as they stop letting the judgment of women get to them, stop thinking that they need to be liked before they get anything, that you'd be a lot further along and I'd probably be out of a job. Um, the next one is sort of rate nine, one of my favorites. You have the right to be illogical in making decisions. Now he says you have the right to be, I would almost say you have the obligation to be. So he says many people will use logic to manipulate us into doing what they want us to do. The basis for this manipulation is our childish belief which says you must follow logic because it makes better judgments than any of us can make. Examples of logic bred manipulation are seen in everyday relationships. This is what I call frame shifting. And it's in my article on manipulation. I think there's also a, like an animated video on it, which is really cool. But here's the thing. Guys are systemizers. We like things to make sense. We like to spot patterns. We like the world to make sense. We think of logic, and this is a bad understanding of logic. We think of logic as a tool that humans use to observe the outside world and objectively come to like a truth. It's not what it's for. Logic is there as a persuasive tool to allow us to persuade people who have that need for uh, uh, closure and patterns and everything to be wrapped up in a nice, neat bow. Here's the thing. It actually is worse now because everybody seems to have a spot of the tism now. So if you're one of those kids that had to have all your trains aligned when you were playing or all your M&Ms and Smarties organized by color, well then yeah. These logical arguments will manipulate you much easier because it has to make sense. So by acting illogically, acting more irrationally, acting more impulsively, acting more spontaneously, you actually make yourself not only more attractive, only because like it's, it's more of a challenge. You can't manipulate somebody who can be impulsive. It also makes you less likely to be manipulated, more attractive in the end, like I said before, and you stop trusting in logic as the primary means of which you need to observe the world because logic is only good as the axioms you put into it if it's garbage in it's going to be garbage out in fact just about every crappy worldview you see right now the other person has an airtight case as to why it's the perfect thing but if you look at their underlying assumptions they're ridiculous in fact let's let's shit on the second wave migtows again Women are evil, they're gonna take your role and your only thing you need to do is go your own way and they'll give you stats and figures and charts and anecdotes and everything. And it's an airtight case. Well, geez, at this rate, women are the absolute worst. So I need to go my own way and buy a sex doll or whatever it is they wanna do. Sounds great, right? But you go back to the underlying assumptions on there and you realize it's based on like a childhood tool of insecurity being manifested in adult justification. Now, this is going to get a bit off topic, but bear with me on this one. It's called transactional analysis or the parent adult child uh, theory of interactions. So in every interaction, there's going to be two people and they're going to manifest either the parent, the adult or the child. Now, Some of these ones are stable. Some of these pairings are unstable. 
what child means is during your formative years, you were given a certain set of tools based on the, like how you see other people around you behave and how they treated you. How did you react as a child to the stimulus around you? These give you a base set of tools that after your development years, you start using as an adult and they create what you would call mental models. Now the problem comes if you're given errant ones by that parent I talked about before that was using identity as a threat point in order to manipulate you and to act the way they want. It's very lazy parenting, also very common. Single parent households notorious for it. And by single parent, I mean mom. That's where promise keepers came from. That's where uh, hyper masculine guys come from. They're raised with nothing but nothing around women, and so they go like. 10 out of 10 what they think a man is and they act like gangster thugs because that's what a man is hyper aggressive all these things are kind of manifest in the same way and so here's the problem when you end up in these interactions and you think of the child interaction the child can't actually analyze things because they didn't have the developmental tools so it's mostly pulling up memories of the feelings of these situations what did it feel like when mom abandoned you even though she was just going to work that day but you're a kid you don't know what work means so these child ones, and this is why, and the way it manifests now is you see how guys, like, have you ever seen a guy who's afraid to approach a girl? And you ask him, why not? Just approach her. It's like, ah, and he kind of makes excuses and he dances around it. And he's like, ah, she's gonna, she's, and they always like point to these consequences. But we did this thing in the married red pill where we would ask a guy, okay, walk me through. What's the worst case scenario here of what happens? And nine times out of 10, the guy had no idea. Like he couldn't articulate the consequences. It was just a fairly bad negative feeling he had. In which case I would always respond, your feelings are bad and you feel bad for having them. But you realize this is those child interactions manifesting. If you cannot articulate the actual threat, the risk or the uh, the fear or aversion that you have in a situation, that's like a, that's a child thing. Now you would automatically think, well, that must mean parent is the better one. Not so much parent is your perspective from a child same thing and seeing how parents would act towards you and the same way i talked about that gangster thug being hyper masculine it's the same thing okay so this is what adults act like i got it and it's it's more articulated than the childhood which is feelings this one's more about uh thoughts and process and actions but then the problem is again they're from the perspective of you have garbage parents coming in you have garbage solutions coming out for the parent thing what you want to move is to adult and adult is essentially observing the, th the world around you and making objective comparisons based on other things and making your own choices in fact here's the part that'll blow your mind if you ever start getting into transaction analysis and a great book to get started is something called i'm okay and you're okay uh, you'll find that when you talk about the praxeology of red pill it's essentially advocating for the adult in the pac model of transactional analysis so it's very cool it's nice to know too that there's like, it's something called convergence theory. Basically, multiple people are making impartial study or making studies on their own independently. And they're finding that, like, obviously, red pill, there's no scientific journals, the soft science, there's not a lot of hard science on it. Everybody's kind of got fuzziness to it. There's no certainty, but everybody's kind of leading in the same direction. So it kind of gives you a certain confidence that that direction's a proper one if multiple people in different places are able to get to a same destination. So what does this mean for being illogical? Yeah, well, that's a game theory thing. It's just, it's it's a better strategy. It works out well for everybody. It makes you more attractive. And at the same time, you're able to shed a lot of these stupid models that you've justified over the years. So like those childhood fears, they end up getting built up over the years with all kinds of random rationalizations after the fact that have perfect logical consistencies to them, but horrible inputs. And that consistency and that predictability makes you easily manipulatable. So not only are you non-assertive, but you're also getting simped on. You don't want that. Um, the next one here is assertive rate nine. You have the right to say, I don't understand. The childish belief we've been trained to hold and which makes sense in this type of manipulation goes like this. You must anticipate and be sensitive to the needs of other people if we are all to live together without discord. You are expected to understand what those needs are without causing problems by making other people spell out their needs to you. If you don't understand without constantly being told what other people want, you are not capable of living in harmony with others and are just being irresponsible or ignorant. What does that sound like to you? I'll give you a hint. Women just want a man who gets it. Um, no, we did not. Abba, I saw your question there. 
but that's a topic for a different show. We'll save that for a Q&A episode or a Patreon question. Um, yeah, so two places where I find this is most telling. One is in a corporate environment. I know anybody here has worked in an office, especially in a technical role. I remember sitting in many meetings where uh, I'm running a project and I see a bunch of business analysts talking about cloud this and cloud this and cloud that and cloud, cloud, cloud. Nobody knew what anybody was talking about. But since everybody was so non-assertive, nobody was willing to say, wait, could you clarify terms? And here's a great assertive thing. Okay, so look, I get it. You guys are talking about cloud because it's a cool buzzword. No such thing as a cloud. It's cloud services. It's basically offloading, offloading your own internal networks. But like, guys, I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about here. Uh, which cloud service you're going for? Can you let me know the possible, like what's your actual implementation you're looking for is so then I can actually structure something that works for you? And just by admitting you don't know, that becomes assertive and that can actually solve problems in the office. Now at home, same thing here. What are you thinking right now? Nothing. Well, why are you mad? No reason. Oh, it's the silent treatment. And then the guys need to constantly prod and poke and like, well, you should know what I'm thinking. It's like, well, look, I don't know. But that's the thing. A girl is manipulating your need for validation by withholding information and expecting you to be a mind reader. Now, again, what's going to happen is most guys will end up like suckling up to the teat, trying to make her feel better, taking responsibility for her emotions in hopes of learning what it is they should already know. But as an assertive technique, just I don't know what you're on about. And if you're going to give me the silent treatment, I'm just going fishing because I actually like fishing when it's quiet. It's probably a great, a great thing for men is to understand that the silent treatment isn't a punishment. It's actually kind of a reward. You're going to love it. Try it. I have mine on occasion. It's actually great. I love it. So having the understanding that you're not meant to know everything, that even though you can't anticipate somebody's needs, maybe you're being insensitive sometime, maybe you don't care, but that's going to be the next point. And that's my favorite one of all these ones. Sort of rate number 10. You have the right to say, I don't care. So if you verbalize this belief, it would sound something like this because of your human condition, you are base and have many flaws. You must try to make up for this humanness by striving to improve until you're perfect in all things. Being human, you will probably fail in this obligation, but you still must want to improve. If somebody else points out how you can improve yourself, you are really obliged to follow his direction. If you don't, you're corrupt, lazy, degenerate, and worthless, and therefore unworthy of respect from anybody, including yourself. This belief, in my opinion, is the ultimate sucker's play. If you set yourself up to be perfect in anything, even being assertive, you will get disappointed and frustrated. You have the assertive right, however, to say you don't care to be perfect according to anybody's definition, including your own, since one man perfection is likely another man's perversion. And I'm going to segue into Duncan on the trad cons, because this is exactly what you get with this crap. Again, putting a pin in this one, too, for that hypothetical and category or yeah, hypothetical and categorical imperatives that I'm going to talk about later. What do they say? Well, a real man would do this, and a man should do this, and a man should this, and a man should that, and a real man this, and the wife will say, well, a real man will do this, and if you were really a good husband, you would do this, and a good boy would clean his room, and you just sit there, and it's like, I don't care. If they can't appeal to your best interests, you're allowed not to give a shit about their problems. In fact, it almost is obliged to, because if they can't even tailor something to be beneficial for you, what good are they? They're just demanding from you. And a very unassertive, non-assertive person is easily manipulatable by that because they want the validation from somebody else. They want somebody to judge them as AKA a good man or AKA a good boy. And so these things tend to work and they build resentment. So not only are you a whipping boy, not only are you lighting yourself on fire to keep others warm, but you're also massively unattractive and she's probably gonna go schlep the gardener anyway. So the only way you can surely halt this manipulation is to ask yourself if you're really satisfied with your own performance on yourself and then make your own judgment on whether or not you wish to make a change. Again, did you screw up? That's up to you. So using a quick rule of thumb to help clarify what you're doing, I often ask people to phrase their internal conflict with any of these categories. I want, I have to, or I should. The I want category is easy. I want to have steak for dinner three times a week. I want to go to the movies instead of watching TV. I want this. I want that. So from these wants, you have certain have tos or the contingencies that follow. For example, if I want steak three times a week, I need to earn X amount of dollars and buy a barbecue. 
Uh, many people, however, mistakes the have tos with the shoulds. So his example here, it muddies the clear waters of thinking. Shoulds, as a rule of thumb, should be categorized as manipulative structure used to get you to do what somebody else wants, or an arbitrary structure you have imposed upon yourself to deal with your own insecurity concerning what you can or cannot do. Sound like the trad cons now? You shouldn't cheat on your wife. Yeah, okay, fatty. I don't see them dropping you at your door. Anyways, for instance, I should work because everybody should be productive, not just because I want to earn X amount of money. I should get out in the evening because I shouldn't watch TV all the time. I shouldn't go to Tahiti because no one should be a beach bum. Whenever you hear yourself or somebody else say should, extend your anti-manipulative antenna as far up as it can go and listen carefully because in all likelihood, some message that says you're not your own judge will follow. This is where I'm going to get into Immanuel Kant. Came up with the terms um, hypothetical categorical imperatives. An imperative is something urgent that needs like to be treated seriously. In this case, a hypothetical one is if you want something, you do something. This is where the I wants and I have tos. What do you want? Well, I want a steak. Well, that means I have to go buy a steak and I have to earn enough money to pay for the steak. There you have a goal. The goal is your want. And then the imperatives or what you should do, what you have to do, end up filling the things. Now, if you're a vegan, that one makes no sense to you. But you have your own set. All right, I need to get the right proteins, this, that, and the other thing. Let's use it from a sexual standpoint. If you want to sleep with more girls, well, then I have to physically make myself more attractive, mentally make myself less unattractive, become more assertive, stop being a nice guy, be honest with my desires to sleep with a girl, not try and be your friends first. Everything we've talked to on here. But those are all hypotheticals. If you don't want to sleep with girls, then you don't need any of these ones. So they aren't something you have to do. Categorical ones, on the other hand, are rules of the universe that are supposed to be good no matter what. And that's that real man should bullshit. <clears throat> so when somebody's telling you what you should do, they're not offering you incentive. They're just telling you that you have to want this and they have no way of telling you why you should want it. Again, strictly 100% manipulative. And there's a reason why thou shalt not is like the terms from the Bible. That kind of manipulation is the kind of stuff that the church used to give you all the time, which if you're a follower of Christ and it's providing you a good life, that's fine. But at least then it's providing a value for you. What I'm finding in a lot of cases, a lot of guys going to church and their church is just running roughshod over them. Their college are, their businesses, their relationships are, and they're telling you all these things you should do, but they're not things you actually want to do. And they're not things that further your own agenda and your own positive movement and your own direction in life that you want to take. Now, part of you has to be cold. If something is not providing value to you, if something is weaponizing you, well then it behooves you as a man to shed that shit from your life instantly. Like I said before, it's very easy when we're talking about dating a thought for two weeks. You try it again when you got a wife and three kids and a life that you just want to suck on an exhaust pipe for 12 hours. And you get back to me on how easy this stuff is. Like I'm saying, it's not, it's not easy, but it's damn serious. So that's it for this chapter. We're going to start the next one tomorrow. Hopefully then we won't have those same streaming issues. Again, smash the like button. Thanks guys for sticking around for, I guess, two or three hours of this. <laughs> Yeah, plain Jane. I've actually, this is actually the fourth time I've gone through this now. So it's about three straight hours of me doing this, but it's good. I'm getting pretty practiced at it. Not that I mind. Um, smash the like button. Feel free to subscribe. Hit the like button. Pass this on to any friends, especially if you have non assertive friends that need this. Give them the book. Again, when I say no, I feel guilty. Uh, the articles inside, check the live chat. You're going to find the ones about Dalrock, about Rolo, and about Chateau Hartiste. And I will catch you guys on the next one. So far, so good. It looks like we made it through the entire episode, guys. I'm very proud of you. David's right, though. You should smash the like. And yeah, I got no problems with Turd Flinging Monkey. He's just an, he's just a he's a only name I know of in the sex doll sphere. So I don't really know who else to talk about. But we're gonna leave it there anyway. I guess this is where the end card goes. All right, later, fellas.